of the busiest travel days of the year and we're stuck knee deep. DIA kept moving through nine and a half inches of snow. Downtown got 11. Same number of RTD operators that called out today, causing mass cancellations for the afternoon ride home. People did get creative in getting around and no one got down like those up north. Dealing with more than a foot in Fort Collins, more than three feet up in Livermore. What a way to welcome the holiday. Thanks, but no thanks. Uh, but you've made it through the worst of the storm. This powerful fall storm is tracking east away from Colorado, where it's going to be somebody else's problem. Tonight, with winds out of the northwest, we're seeing the snow really come to an end, but temperatures are going to fall, and that'll be the next part of the weather story. 9.5 officially at DIA, 1 to 3 feet from Jamestown to Drake. Larimer County doing very well with the storm, as was kind of ground zero, the northern front range foothill areas. More totals on 9news.com. As the system pulls away, skies will clear, the snow comes comes to an end and all the travel advisories will be canceled out across the state as well. But it's really slick out there, so be careful walking and driving. It's pretty icy. Our high today was actually only 25 degrees. We should be closer to 50 and we're not going to see that number for several days. But the good news is we've got a sunny day coming up tomorrow and a warmer day coming up for the holiday ahead of what? Another storm? Yeah, and another chance for snow. That's later. Tonight, clear cold and five with the wind chill of minus four. Tomorrow, sunshine 28. The holiday, the best day of the week with temperatures in the 40s. 30% chance of snow showers on Friday, a cool, dry weekend, and then temperatures actually warm up, but not till Monday of next week, Kyle. Thank you, Kathy. Settle in, get cozy, and consider this tonight. Doesn't it seem that when the snow comes down, Colorado's generosity and kindness goes up. So I mean, for all of our sea slicker whining about the snow we got in Denver, you know that Northern Colorado just got buried. And one guy with the day off from work decided that he would do whatever he could to make it easier on his neighbors. Arnold Brennan caught up with him. The weather service was like, it's dangerous to commute. I was like, I still got to get to work. If only those who chose to walk were warned. It's like three miles. There was another way to get through 15 inches of snow. That looked like cardio, not my bag. <laughs> Ryan Glitch. Yeah, just like the computer screw up. And his 93 Dodge Ram Charger. I'm about to go drag people through the snow because they got stuff to do and it's a little gnarly out. I have pulled six cars out of the snow with this. I pushed three through intersections where it wasn't plowed real good. Uh, by hand, not with a bumper. In Loveland, Longmont, and Fort Collins, several took him up on the offer he posted to Facebook. And I've taken one lady to surgery, another lady to get her prescription filled, one they needed groceries. I'm bringing firewood to somebody later tonight. And his truck didn't do all the work. Ryan shoveled more than one driveway in short sleeves. Doesn't hurt to be nice. What would, what would Mr. Rogers do? <laughs> Just the kind of neighbor you want in Northern Colorado. I'm just trying to be the kind of person my dog thinks I am. Is that the quote? For next, I'm Noel Brennan. I love it. He got his cardio in by the end of the day. Ryan says he just plans to be out as long as he can tonight, helping people wherever he can. And if you're thinking, well, that's how a native Coloradan does it. I regret to inform you that Ryan grew up in the snow of New York State. Yeah, good people come from all over. I will say I admire people like Ryan who chose to be out in it today to help, but I especially admire those who have jobs that don't quit in the snow. Now, our Marshall Zellinger has one of those jobs, but if we're being honest, Marshall, ours is one of the easier jobs you can do in the snow compared to a lot of the people you met today. So you're out at Pepsi Center, and I'm thinking, well, Nuggets game indoors, what's there to do outside? But then again, I'm not real bright. Hey, the action is still going on outside the arena one hour before tip off because all the people who have to park in the lot here need to be able to get from the lot inside. You can still see the uh, crew shoveling the sidewalk. We've got the heavy lifting equipment that has emptied out what I'm told is about 50 acres worth of parking lot snow. And it's still going on where people have to work outside. On this side, we've got the people accepting the money for all the drivers that want to park in the freshly plowed lot. They're not the only ones that we've seen out in the freezing cold through no fault of their jobs. 
How's it going? On a snowy day like today. Have a good one. Stay warm. I feel like the guests should be saying that to him. They do look like lamps, but they're actually heaters. Randall Williams moved to Colorado from Southern California for a track scholarship. They actually do call me back home. They're like, it's 80 degrees and you're in a foot of snow. And I'm actually like, I would rather the snow than be in 80 degrees when it's actually winter time. Now, as a valet attendant in Cherry Creek North, Randall's track speed is best used running to the heater. It's basically a 75, 25, me and my me and my coworker, we switch off and we go inside, a little five minute break, and then we come right back and switch off every here and there. What did you say you were wearing to stay warm? Uh, rubber boots, thermals, and waterproof gloves and hat. Yeah, and a big scarf that goes down to my knees. So I'm good to go. <laughs> we found Zoe wrangling carts at King Supers in Glendale, which leads me to this public service announcement. Perhaps wrangle your own cart so the Zoe's of the world don't have to. I can't blame them though. I would want to go home too. Over at the Pepsi Center, seven plows and three excavators have been clearing the parking lots. We once tried to move the snow by dump trucks. We found that it freezes in the back of the trucks. Normally, we'd tell you to stay off the road and watch the Nuggets on TV, but well, you know, that, that's another story altogether. So since you might have no choice but to go to the game, we were curious where they hide all the snow. Usually we'll put it into landscaping, we'll put it into the retention pond. As I said earlier, we'll put some in your car if you'd like to take it home. Take some free snow, <laughs> yes. Cue the light rail stop for people to walk through this live shot, which is perfect. By the way, there is not a driver shortage or, uh, uh, for the light rail stopping at the Pepsi Center. Uh, this is a great promotion that the Nuggets have tonight. Nuggets win, take some snow home with you. Nuggets lose, take some snow home with you. Kyle, I'll bring this one back for you. Oh, thank you. You are so, you are so kind. Oh, they're going to make a mountain of that snow in the corner of the parking lot, and it'll be gone in the Colorado sun in a week. There's a good number of uh, Oh. Oh, I thought I didn't hit I, anybody. Oh, jeez. Okay. All right. Well, that, that could have gone sideways on us fast. Steve Sager over here thinks you killed a man. All right. Thank you, Marshall. <laughs> Appreciate it. So uh, this is a rowdy crew we've got here today. So if you remember, we let Steve Steger work from home on the last snow day. He decided to come in today and decided that he would take his chances with RTD. How'd that go? Actually, great. Steve's RTD experience was awesome. Getting to work today was going to be like rolling dice, so I figured why not really gamble and ride public transit? And I've got to say, for all of its struggles, RTD really delivered for me today. My train was at the station as I walked up. It traveled at normal speeds, got me to the city in perfect time. My bus was waiting there. The driver was friendly. I got to work with 40 minutes to spare and no white knuckles. If we're going to cover the challenges RTD faces, I figure we ought to cover the victories too. Yes, indeed. And no sooner than Steve complimented RTD and they started dropping train trips left and right for the afternoon commute. Here's the deal. 11 light rail operators did not come to work and they don't have people to spare. Listen, it's a snowy day. I bet there are people who didn't come to your work as well. But what that meant at RTD was that they had to cancel nearly one in 10 of their train trips for the day. So. Steger took the afternoon to see if other cities are having similar transit operator shortages. If you get RTD rider alerts, your inbox got stuffed this afternoon. The end result of 11 light rail operators calling out is 94 canceled trips out of the 1,000 plus scheduled today. RTD shortage really stings on a day like today. Ben Freed speaks for the Transit Research and Advocacy Group Transit Center. RTD seems to be feeling this more acutely than other agencies. The first agency that I'm aware of that is considering scaling back service. But RTD is not alone, he says. San Francisco, Miami, St. Louis, Omaha, and northern New Jersey all are, are all having similar problems. What's fascinating about that, Fried says, you can't seem to find one common denominator in any of those cities. I think it's interesting that this problem is affecting areas that have uh, that are in vastly different economic circumstances. San Fran, for instance, is facing a shortage in large part because of the housing crisis there. Bus drivers just can't afford to pay the rent. You know, San Francisco hopes to claw their way back out with uh, a more generous new contract that they've just reached with their operators. 
St. Louis and Omaha aren't facing the same housing situation, but still can't find drivers. Despite the common shortage in these cities, only Denver is suggesting cutting service to try to solve the problem. Freed says it's sad, but smart. It is better to be honest about what you can do with your budget than to pretend you can run more service than you actually can. So there's a caveat to that. Freed says if RTD is cutting service to solve this problem, they also need to present a plan that they're going to fix it at the same time that they present that plan to cut service. And Kyle Fried says cities like Chicago and New York aren't dealing with these same sorts of problems because transit there is so ingrained and those agencies are focused on operating more than innovating and building. They can put more money into the budget that way. That, that makes a lot of sense to you. I, I think sometimes when we're looking at RTD successes and failures, it's so difficult to compare them to somebody else because the ridership rates are so much lower here than they are in a New York or Chicago, and they're in the process of building it out, whereas other cities aren't. It's interesting, though, what your expert was saying about the fact that, you know, maybe if you're building out, you can't sustain. Yeah, that's part of the problem. And, and he also mentioned that car-centric cities tend to struggle with this. Yeah. That, you, you know, New York and Chicago, it is so much part of their culture there that they have to fund it and they have to sure. figure out ways. Nice sweater. Thank you. Nice sweater, too. Appreciate that. Thanksgiving is two days away, and we are celebrating our holiday fails, remembering it's the thought that counts. Jeremy shared a photo of the carnage. 20 people waiting to eat, read his caption. Luckily, Sprouts had two fresh turkeys, and we were only delayed 30 minutes. This seems to be a not uncommon problem. Oh, you can actually see the flames on that one. See, see at this point, I don't know, Steve, I'm pulling that out. Like, I, there's a chance to save that. I, I think you can save this. Chris Nolan said everything was supposed to be perfect. It wasn't. Here's the deal, folks. Perfect is boring. Perfect is for Instagram. Keep your fails coming. We love them here. Next at 9news.com is the email, or use the hashtag HeyNext. Colorado's doing a head count. They're supposed to count everyone. Really. So we're talking about um, people who are incarcerated. We're talking about our immigrant and refugee communities, elderly. We're talking about children under five. That's because more people means more power. And our parade of holiday fails continues with a dog that can't see, but makes up for it with something else. Next.
Let's celebrate more of your holiday fails. A reminder to uh, kiss the cook, not make her angry. Barbara wrote in to tell about her parents when mom slaved over Thanksgiving dinner and dad said, could you use some salt, ma? So she dumped the rest of the Morton salt container over his plate and proceeded to serve the rest of dinner to everybody else, said the dad, who was too afraid to laugh. Denver is trying so hard to get people to care about the census. You know, there's lots of like inspirational posters and eye catching billboards. When our new Roy sat down with city leaders, she got a run through of exactly what is at stake. It turns out there's roughly $13 billion in it for Colorado, depending on a good head count. A head count in a state where some people are scared to participate. There's a lot riding on these posters and brochures meant to encourage people to participate in the census, that their information will be kept safe, and the more people counted in Colorado, the more political power it gets. It's been around since 1790. But no matter how important or that it's constitutionally mandated, Councilwoman Deborah Ortega knows some people are nervous, even though in a close 5-4 to four vote, the Supreme Court tossed a citizenship question on the census. It took a little while for the courts to make that decision, so it sort of has um, forced the rest of us to speed up the work we have to do. With four months left to go, Denver, with the help of MSU's president and faith leaders, is trying to connect with hard to reach communities. We're talking about our immigrant and refugee communities, elderly, we're talking about children under five. They're, they're gonna take information from their pastor, their teacher, their friends, their family members. Denver has a lot on the line. Nearly one and a half billion federal dollars depends on an accurate headcount. That's $13 billion for the state. But how much Colorado gets depends on how many people live here. People have kids in our schools. We all drive our roads. Lots of people rely on health care. It covers all of the various categories that we get federal resources for. Then there's the fact that Colorado's gotten bigger and that could mean a new addition for the state. So we estimate that we'll probably get another seat in the House of Representatives. So all this applies for city council boundaries as well, and the city's working to make sure that each district has roughly the same number of people in it. So after the last census, some boundaries did change in Denver to keep all of that even. The city says they're going to check that again after this next count on April, which Kyle, for the first time, you can fill out online. So I think people think about the census as a today thing, but I mean, mm -hmm. like I've gone to the census to look up like who used to live in my old house or like right. where my family lived generations ago. So eventually this stuff comes out. Yeah, but it's going to be 72 years before the government can release any kind of details after that census count date. And the workers are taking an oath for life saying they will never talk about any of the data they collect. What happened to your sweater? I got in trouble last time. I was told I looked too casual. <laughs> <laughs> you, Plus, we, it kind of looked like yours. It would be very matchy-matchy yeah, today. <laughs> yeah, we were twinning, and now you got dressed up. And, and I now know. I, I feel like, like I missed out on a great opportunity. Yeah, I look like some kind of Mr. Rogers slob <laughs> over here. All right, thank you, Nusha. The most Colorado thing we've seen today, and man, we saw a lot of them. I like this one, though, because it has a little bit of a surprise at the end. Because you're like, oh, look, it's a guy in a snowmobile. Oh, no, 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 it's a dog with doggles, I think those are called. I believe those are doggles. I also love what appears to be a lot of eye contact from Tallulah the Boxer, who just loves to play on the snow and does it on a snowmobile, because why not? What's the most Colorado thing you've seen today? I know you have good entries for me. Use the hashtag HeyNext, or send me an email at next at 9 
We tend to meet people on one of their worst days or one of their best days. We witnessed some of both in the short time we knew Becky Robinson from Boulder County. The winner of the nine fan card contest passed away last night. We first met Becky Robinson when she was short on days and long on gratitude. Not even hospice and an oxygen hose could hide her smile and her thankfulness for a friend like Mary, who knew that Becky wouldn't be able to dip her toes in the ocean again like she wanted, but would love the chance to see her beloved Denver Broncos up close. You made that happen, voting Becky the winner of the nine fan card contest. We weren't sure if Becky would feel up to going, but she gathered the strength to go along with that gratitude, and she soaked up every moment with Mary at her side. There was no hiding that Becky's time was short. Knowing that that made people uncomfortable, she was quick to smile, to laugh, and in the quiet moments, to tell everyone that she had enjoyed every moment. 60 years of moments. Her proudest were those spent raising her son, Will. We think of him tonight as we remember Becky Robinson, a mother, a fan, a friend. Your holiday fails just keep coming. Thanksgiving 2012 at the Angler's house. They'll never forget it. Kara told us the story of Gracie, the family's blind dog who smelled an opportunity that smelled like turkey, and she polished off the entire main course before the family could get to it. I love that your feedback tonight has so much thankfulness. Jennifer, thankful for grocery store workers, TJ for police and firefighters, Kathy for snowplow drivers and mail carriers. But Mark, Mark says that roaring fire in the background, whether wood or gas, is a great example of how not to address climate change. Dude, it's a TV. See you next time.